Oh, I forgot my bell. Hello, good morning. I usually have a bell and I forgot it. It's a nice way. I'm kind of echoing. Can you hear me okay? I have to first say I'm so impressed that everybody gets here at 7.30 in the morning. I'm not really a morning person, so I'm always amazed and we greatly appreciate your support. I, I wanted to just start briefly by recognizing our change makers. Uh, that is our group of alumni and friends who support our school. And it, it's really important for us because we have so many scholarships and programs and exciting activities going on, but we need your support to help us with that. And I'm happy after the presentation if anybody wants to find out more about what we're doing because we're really excited about it. Our newest member is Dennis Keith. Are you here, Dennis? Somewhere? There you are. Thank you so much. Um, I also want to kind of not read from the script about Dave, our Dave Feldman, our speaker today, and just go through all of his credentials, but really just tell you a little about Dave from my experience with him, and you'll certainly be impressed with his vast knowledge. He's He's a, well, I'll tell you just the, the basic details. He's a professor in the Department of Urban Planning and Public Policy. And what I learned, I didn't know this about Dave, I learned that he was actually an energy and environmental policy analyst at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. The big issue is he is someone that is really committed to the environment. He's really committed to making a difference. He was the chair of urban planning public policy for nine years, which is no small feat. Um, and he's the founding director of Water UCI. And our school is committed to solving important social and environmental problems. And I'm sure you all agree because you're here, water is probably one of the biggest problems that we have, and particularly in California, where our history in many ways is a history of water in the state. You know, it's been the subject of movies and whatnot. And he's the founding director of Water UCI, which is located in the School of Social Ecology, but it's interdisciplinary. And what we try to do with, with centers like Water UCI is connect across the different schools, because we're not the only folks working on water. So having an institute or a center allows us to bridge seamlessly across and address issues of uh, applied water science, technology, management, policy. I've learned a lot about desalination, which has been interesting. I'm a psychologist, so very interesting for me. And we are really in our school trying to showcase environment, and we're doing a lot, and we have a lot of initiatives coming on board around environment. So we're so fortunate to have Dave be a faculty member, and we're also fortunate to have him here today. So please welcome Dave Feldman. Appreciate it. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here this morning and to see many familiar faces, including some former students of mine, proving you must be gluttons for punishment for coming to listen to me. Uh, we're going to talk about California's drought and whether or not we're prepared for the next water crisis. I want to cover three things this morning. We're going to talk a little bit about this past drought, what drought is, why it's important, why we're going to continue to have droughts. Secondly, we're going to talk about what we have been doing in this last drought to try to fortify ourselves against some of its problems. And last, but by no means least, what do we need to do to be resilient against future droughts? Because while droughts will come and droughts will go, they will remain very serious problems, particularly in the light of what many scientists believe is an inevitable change in our climate, which will have dramatic effects on our water. So with that, let me begin with this uh, statement, the new normal. A couple of years back, I had the privilege of being on a tour with the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. We went up to Oroville Dam, and I took this picture when Oroville, which is at the topmost portion of the state water project right here, Chasta is part of a federal project, but Oroville is part of the state water project that provides water for much of California, including our region. Uh, Oroville was at 40% elevation at this time, really very, very drought stricken. And yet, less than two years later, major rain events in Northern California, which not only led to an overflow 
of Oroville's spillway structure, but the resort to the emergency spillway structure and intense damage in tens of millions of dollars of repair costs that the taxpayers of California will continue to bear for some time to come. I like this picture for a couple of reasons. One is because it really underscores the crisis that we're facing in California, in the Southwest, and worldwide. And that is intense climate variability. We worry when it rains, we worry when it doesn't. We have extremes of drought, which will be punctuated by periods of intense precipitation. And how do we manage this tremendous variability in light of climate change? Whether that's the new normal or not, I can't say. But I can tell you it's abnormal based upon what's our recent experience. This, of course, is Lake Mead, Hoover Dam, a very critical work on the lower Colorado River, which provides water supply for seven states and, of course, electricity for much of the region as well. Uh, this is a persistent drought. In this case, you're not getting drought punctuated by rainfall or snow melt. You're getting a continued low flow in the Colorado Basin. If the water level falls any lower behind these intake structures behind the dam, that puppy will not be able to generate hydroelectricity. Aside from the fact that the protection of in-stream flow downstream is in great danger. Drought is an evolving crisis. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this uh, set of maps other than to say you'll notice that the darker shaded areas grew in intensity over time and then finally abated in the last couple of years. One of the things, though, that's interesting about this diagram is people often wonder, who determines that we're in a severe drought? And this is not a totally objective concept. In fact, there are about 200 climate scientists, hydrologists, and others convened by the U.S. Geological Survey that look at factors like rainfall, uh, precipitation in general, stream flow, uh, wind speeds, relative precipitation, and even soil moisture to come up with these maps. The point is it's definitely a variable, not a constant. What about future drought? Well, I want to show you a couple of figures that I think really underscore some of the challenges that we're going to be facing in California and the Southwest. And I'm going to start with the figure on the right. Much of the water that we have in the southwestern United States originates as snowpack in the Rockies and in California in the Sierras. And what you can see, according to this report from the Global Change Research Program, which was just published last November, is that over time, by century's end, we expect dramatic decreases in snowpack in the mountain regions, which will mean reduced precipitation, snow melt, reduced stream flow, and even reduced recharge of our groundwater basins. One of the problems that that underscores is evinced from this picture on the right, which is basically Colorado River. And this is a figure that I borrowed from the Public Policy Institute of California. The yellow line represents demands over time, and they have increased incessantly along the lower Colorado Basin. But supply, represented by the blue line, has varied and in recent years has actually declined. We're now at an intersection where we're actually committed to more water from the Colorado Basin than there is stream flow in the Colorado Basin. That clearly is not sustainable. Well, when crisis struck, what did we do? Well, we did a lot of things. This is something that should harken back to Governor Brown's announcement, which was uh, exactly five years ago. Uh, how time flies when we're having fun, right? Uh, this was, of course, what the governor decided to do as a result of the drought. The executive order, which uh, a lot of people kind of forgot about, uh, imposed restrictions on water suppliers to achieve a statewide 25% reduction in potable use. That varied. It was a statewide average. Here in Irvine, for example, Irvine Ranch Water District, as many of you know, who work with the district, who are consumers of the district like myself, know that because of all of the conservation efforts that IRWD had been able to achieve, their mandate was 16%, not 25%. That's not true for other districts around the state. Uh, also, there were uh, water efficiency measures that were imposed. These were temporary measures. They were abated when the drought abated. But nevertheless, a lot of things that we, economists and others would call low-hanging fruit. 
things that just made a lot of sense. Reducing water use, increasing efficiencies, not irrigating your sidewalk and your driveway like some of my neighbors do. Uh, things that just kind of make a lot of sense. We did reduce water demands. As a matter of fact, as these figures show, even before the drought, many water uses in California, both urban and agricultural, actually plateaued. What's interesting is that the reduction accelerated during the formal announcement of a drought, and that was very, very helpful. One of the things that the bottom figure notes is something that we don't often uh, talk about in California. And that is that, in fact, uh, agricultural water use, we often, particularly in urban Southern California, want to blame farmers and agriculture for profligate water use. In fact, water use has been reduced in agriculture. And in fact, farm gross domestic product has actually increased. So there has been some pro progress made. There can be more progress for sure, but some progress has been made. So don't talk with our mouths full, as my mom used to say. But we abated our water use only for a while. And one of the things that we saw once the drought emergency was declared over is a rebound effect, which is exemplified by these two figures. Both were provided from data via the California Water Resources Control Board in Sacramento. What this suggests is that while our behavior does change during periods of drought, it tends to revert back to old habits once the drought ends. And this is something that we don't think is going to be sustainable given the likelihood of tremendous climate variability and continued droughts in the future. So I want to spend some time with you this morning talking about what my colleagues, people I work with around the world, uh, some of the research that we've been doing through the Water Center and others think needs to be done. And rather than use the word sustainability, which is a word we often throw around, I'm going to introduce or reintroduce a different word, which is resilience. That is to say, droughts will come, droughts will go. We can't talk about sustaining something when we don't have a natural availability of water. So we're going to have to become fortified against future droughts. And that's what I mean by resilience. A few years ago, Cal uh, Water UCI had a statewide conference on the California drought. A number of you in this room attended that meeting. Uh, all nine uh, major campuses of the University of California were represented at that meeting, as well as researchers from other institutions around the region, as well as water agencies and others. And what we did in our uh, convocation was to produce then an article synthesizing many of our findings. And this was co-written with our colleagues at some of the other universities and appeared in the journal Nature and was simply called Water and Climate Recognize Anthropogenic Drought. Translation in simple English, human-caused drought. Wait a minute, I thought droughts were natural. How do humans cause drought? Well, our basic argument in this paper was that droughts are natural. They come, they go. Climate change will make them more frequent and intense. But it's our behavior, our activity, that worsens their impacts. And one of the things that we forgot in the major drought that we just had in California is that there are also ecological impacts. You and I were inconvenienced. Our taps were not shut off. There were many sacrifices that many people made, but fish who need water, usually every day, really did suffer. And that was one of the things that is not really discussed very much as a result of this major drought. So in thinking about resilience, we have to think about averting or mitigating environmental impacts. So what do we mean by resilience? Well, we mean many things, but basically we mean a transition, a gradual but nevertheless an inevitable transition to renewable, low energy water sources, reliance on more integrated management, don't look for a single panacea because there ain't one, but to use a number of different innovations in cooperation linked together, and of course, better conservation. So what does resilience really look like? And in a book that uh, I wrote a few years ago, uh, after much agonizing, the publisher came up with this totally original title of water. Uh, 
I've never understood the publishing industry. Anyway, uh, getting back to where we're talking about, uh, resilient options basically have four factors, four components to them. They are technically feasible. Science and engineering has to support it. Obviously, we have to start with what makes engineering sense. What works to provide additional water supply or to use water more efficiently? But we also have to consider economics. Are the options that we choose affordable and equitable in terms of the burden of the costs and how they fall upon various groups? And you can't just determine that in a vacuum. You have to compare the options to viable alternatives. This is where we get into debates between should we use desalination, should we rely on wastewater reuse. We'll get to that point in a few moments. And of course, environmental impacts and risk. Uh, every option, even conservation, has some sort of a risk to somebody. Can those adverse impacts, if they exist, be mitigated? That's a crucial item. And finally, and this falls clearly in the realm of research that I, as a political scientist, do, and that is, are the options publicly acceptable? Does the public trust and have a voice in shaping options? And that includes confidence in the institutions that manage the options. This is critical not only in California, not only in the US of A, but worldwide, as we will see. Oh, let's let the cat out of the bag and start with de uh, seawater desalination. This is a figure that came out of an article in Science Magazine a couple of years back, looking at the various energy uses that go into desalination. And in fact, desalination does raise a lot of questions, as all of you in this room know. It is expensive per unit of water. It is high energy consumption, though energy consumption, many advocates would say, is going down over time. It's still an important factor. It's one of the factors that leads to the cost. There are, of course, environmental impacts that have to be mitigated. Can they be? Open question. Many people are debating this as we speak. Here in Singapore, in Israel, in Saudi Arabia, and elsewhere. That is entrainment, trapping of small aquatic creatures. And of course, brine disposal. What do you do with the solid salt, uh, saline wastes? Do you simply disperse them back into the near ocean environment? And is that safe and ecologically sound? Aesthetics. Here in California, we love our coastline. Desalination plants can be noisy. They certainly have a large land uh, footprint. These are real issues. You can't simply dismiss them and say, well, they're not important. Who cares what the public thinks? And what I would argue, and with the asterisk is something I added, is the synergy with other sources. Again, I'll come back to an earlier point. If this is one of the options you select, you can't simply rely on this option alone. There are no options that, in fact, are panaceas. So how does this option intermingle with other available and possible options. So what about some answers in terms of addressing concerns? Well, this is the Carlsbad project. I'm not going to go into the details. You can see them yourself. It's an expensive project. Water unit cost is about $1,800 per acre foot. For those of you who are not math majors, an acre foot is about 326,000 gallons. Okay, it's about enough water to support uh, two families of four for about a year. California, one single acre foot. Uh, there was an on-site energy plant, so that was one thing that was available. Diffusers were used for the brine, are being used. This is very critical. Long-term rate agreements to basically lock in the charges that were imposed on consumers in North San Diego County, and some integration with other sources. In San Diego's case, uh, there really isn't an available groundwater basin in which to store large amounts of water, so it had to be integrated with other available sources. And because there seemed to be relatively few options and the costs were spread out, uh, public support. But in thinking about desalination and whether or not it's a viable option, particularly given that rubric that I introduced before, it might be good to think about some international lessons. And I want to revert to Israel, where I've done a lot of work with some colleagues at Tel Aviv University and other places. Uh, many of you know that after the last major drought in Israel in the early 2000s, the country committed to building five privately owned and privately operated uh, desalination plants, which produce roughly 80% of the country's urban supply. Most of the cities, of course, uh, Haifa, Jaffa, Tel Aviv being along the coast. 
about basically roughly half of Israel's population lives in coastal cities. However, by the admission of the Israel Water Authority, which oversees water supply in the country and water use, it's not a panacea. In fact, climate change will worsen the crisis, and since demands for water will increase inland in those regions which produce Israel's agriculture, desalination is not going to be the problem. Other solutions will have to be introduced, and in fact are being introduced. Israel also reuses a great deal of wastewater. In their case, wastewater reused for agriculture is a major source of food and fiber production in Israel. Almost all of the water in agriculture in Israel is from recycled wastewater. They also aggressively pursue drip irrigation and the mandates of water-saving appliances in all communities. There's also broad consensus over water as a security issue in Israel. Don't need to spend a lot of time on that, other than to say it has actually induced some cooperation with its neighbors. For example, Jordan and Israel are actually collaborating on a plan to build a desalination plant uh, near uh, Eilat. Actually, the plant will be built in Aqaba, which is in Jordan, very close to Eilat, uh, near the Red Sea. And in fact, the water will be transferred up into the Dead Sea to try to restore that water body and its ecological character. And the remainder desalinated water will be sent to Amman and communities adjacent to Amman. So this is a cooperative program that in fact actually reduces insecurity in water in the region. Final note. Israel allocates water withdrawal permits. Water is not a rights-based commodity in Israel. There are no water rights that are linked to the ownership or control of land. When you put all these things together, you have not a panacea, but a policy choice that was made not only because it seemed to make technical sense, but it had some economic sense. It certainly uh, related to other risks that were trying to be mitigated and it had large public approval. Some of you recognize uh, Wilfred Brimley, the actor. This is a pun on reusing wastewater, but in fact the concept of porcelain springs is not simply a figment of uh, an advertising uh, genius's imagination, but it's something that we actually do. And of course we do it right here in Southern California. The Orange County Water District is the largest purveyor of recycled wastewater to recharge our groundwater basin. And I guess I can say it now since you've had breakfast, the water that you sampled outside is uh, recycled wastewater. It's costly. Uh, it has some energy consumption issues associated with it. There are some health concerns about what needs to be done to ensure that wastewater is uh, clean and pure enough and safe enough to drink. And in fact, the process is very, very complex, but it does work, it is mitigable, and it's well integrated with other sources. I mentioned the fact that in Orange County, it's integrated with management of the groundwater base. The plant in Fountain Valley that produces recycled wastewater is not called the wastewater treatment plant. It's called the groundwater replenishment system because that's exactly what it does. And, of course, the facing of stigma and other concerns is a very important issue. In Orange County, that was done by very, very conscientious public outreach and a high degree of trust. Uh, in other communities, particularly the San Fernando Valley, part of Los Angeles, where reuse has been discussed for many years, that remains an issue, and it's one of the barriers to adopting reuse on a large scale. So what about this issue of addressing concerns? Well, in the Orange County case, I want to indicate just a couple of lessons that I think are important for us to take. And I'm going to start with this chart on the right. I apologize for the fact that it's a little difficult to read. But basically, what we've seen over time is that this purple, appropriately enough, as in purple pipe, has increased. This is water that's generated by the groundwater replenishment system, which replenishes our groundwater basin and then becomes the source of our water supply. Over time, that's going up, while reliance upon imported water is decreasing. That's resilience. That's what we want to aim for. That's what makes this project, in the opinion of many of us, such a great idea. 
And the project was built on time and within budget, which if a public works project is going to be built in Orange County, that's something you want to make sure you do if you want to build public confidence and trust. It's integrated with other sources. Uh, flood flows on the Santa Ana River also are part of the system that is managed within this groundwater replenishment system. Advanced treatment is employed, very highly advanced treatment. I mentioned the concerted public outreach, and I think very important, the project had public confidence in part because it ensured that Orange County could continue to see some population growth, that in fact we would not be limited in our ability to continue to have a built environment by reliance on imported sources of water. These all add up to what we're talking about when we talk about resilience. But what about other places? Well, let me turn to another example. We've worked with some colleagues in Australia over the past several years, uh, and Australia, which went through what was called the Millennium Drought between roughly 1996 and 2010. Got that name, by the way, because climate scientists in Australia said the last time the subcontinent probably experienced a drought of this magnitude was maybe 1,000 years ago. Think about that one. Uh, it, the government at all levels in Australia employed a system of public engagement to encourage reuse, mostly for non-potable uses. In fact, there were discussions held in all major cities and even in small communities around Australia. What should we do? Here are some ideas we in the water agencies have. What do you folks in the population think we should do? It was a two-way discussion. And basically, what was adopted was a tremendous reliance on reuse and introduction of other innovations in conjunction. And again, resilience being the goal. So rainwater tanks. You drive through cities like Melbourne, and you're considered unpatriotic if you don't have a rainwater tank in your yard. When it does rain, you can use that water for your gardens. You can use it to wash your car. You can even use it to wash laundry. Uh, water storage in parks and mar marshes, and replumbing homes to use gray water from uh, washing machines, dishwashers, and so forth, in conjunction with rainwater tanks, to actually re-engineer the household and actually use every source of water to maximum efficiency. This figure at the top right is one that uh, my co-authors and I generated when we produced an article on what went on in Melbourne. And the bottom line here is that reuse, recycled effluent, definitely was a major source of water supply and remains a, a significant source of water supply, but mostly for non-potable uses. Once the drought officially ended, reliance on pure recycled uh, water for expedient use tended to decline because the public said, we prefer uh, not to use that if we don't need to. Now, in Australia, the recycled wastewater is not stored in a groundwater basin in Melbourne. It was direct potable reuse. So that was part of the issue, and it remains a legacy of what's taking place in Australia today. Uh, also, I mentioned policy reforms. Uh, the government of Australia mandates that during a drought, all water agencies must collaborate on mutual plans for drought management. I want to talk a little bit about conservation. Those of you here in Irvine, this is going to sound pretty familiar to you, but you know that Irvine Ranch Water District was a pioneer in an inverted tier pricing system. The more water you use per unit, you pay more for. Does it work? Well, this budget-based system definitely discourages overuse. We know it for a fact. We've seen a 50% reduction in per capita residential use since its introduction in the early 90s. And the average residential use per person per day is among the lowest in California. This is all very good news. But even Irvine Ranch Water District realized that in the throes of our last drought and in the prospects of future drought, it may not be enough, which raises the question, what else can be done? Well, prior to the drought, IRWD offered a turf replacement rebate program. Program still exists. And we, in col uh, collaboration with uh, Water UCI and Irvine Ranch uh, officials, uh, were offered the opportunity to do a study, not, mind you, on how much water was saved through turf replacement, though that's something that we hope to do in the future, but who 
and why are people adopting turf replacement? Basically, trying to understand if one can change behavior during the midst of a drought. So we analyzed 1,500 lawn rebate applications way back to 2010 up through 2017 in 77 villages throughout Irvine. And what we found is that as the drought worsened, Google searches in this area for turf rebates increased, as did turf removal rebate applications. Now, this is a very crude sort of social survey, but I think it gets the point across that all of these things increased, and they all dramatically increased once the governor declared a drought emergency. Lesson here, leadership is important. Public information is critical. And of course, we can take any good idea a little too far. Some of you might remember this interesting little anecdote. Tony Corcoran uh, was a sort of self-designated uh, uh, drought police person. And uh, he spent his uh, time in communities throughout the LA area trying to discourage people from watering their lawns during the heart of the drought. Uh, one woman quickly tiring of his lecture on conservation while she watered her plants uh, decided to turn her hose on him. Uh, okay, are there any deeper lessons here? for resilience. I think there are. Uh, shaming or outing people, taking pictures and putting them on Facebook or other social media, uh, may have a cathartic effect. It may make you and I feel good, but it does not, uh, in fact, get people to conserve water. It has unintended consequences, including uh, irrigated people. Uh, a better way is something that water agencies have been doing in California with increasing uh, frequency, and that is showing how much water you use compared to an average household in your area and the most efficient household in your area. We call this norming, and in fact, most of us want to be within a norm. We don't want to use more water than our neighbors. And if something goes wrong, of course, the first thing we think about is, oh my gosh, there must be a leak. I'll have to call the water agency. It's their fault, which is often, most often, of course, not the truth. I want to talk a little bit quickly about some other innovations. Stormwater harvesting. Last week, good example. It does rain. And when it does, if we could capture that water, store it for long periods of time and reuse it, we might be on to something. In fact, uh, the city of Los Angeles, let me back up just a bit here. Uh, the city of Los Angeles, in fact, uh, is counting on uh, uh, stormwater harvesting as a key instrument to create a more resilient uh, Los Angeles. And they have to, given the fact that over time, as we know, their reliance on the uh, Owens Valley Aquifer, or the Owens Valley, excuse me, the Owens Valley Aqueduct and the Colorado River are decreasing over time. Uh, as well as reliance on the Bay Delta. So in fact, stormwater harvesting is going to be critical. But it requires policy change. Last November, the voters in LA uh, voted uh, by uh, over, a little over 70% to adopt something called Measure W. It's a parcel tax of two and a half cents a square foot, uh, basically to meet obligations under the Clean Water Act. Now, that's very critical. Why the Clean Water Act? Well, Stormwater harvesting in this case was not something that was prompted by the desire to capture stormwater and reuse it, though that will be one of the incidental consequences. The real goal was to keep polluted stormwater out of Santa Monica Bay and Long Beach as well, because under the Clean Water Act, the county of Los Angeles is in violation of the Clean Water Act by not being able to capture uh, this water and prevent the pollutants from entering the bay. Supporters said it would also help make the region more water resilient in the face of drought and climate change by paying for projects that improve water quality, and it may increase water supply and provide community benefits such as parks or wetlands. That remains to be seen. This is a long-term measure, but again, that word resilience is definitely in there. About four years ago, the state legislature passed something called the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. That's another thing that Water UCI is looking at. We're going to have a workshop this summer on that subject. 
and the number of people that are going to be involved in that are in this room. So we're looking forward to what you come up with as solutions. But one of the things that the Groundwater Sustainable Groundwater Act may help us do is actually help us think about creative and innovative ways to capture more stormwater, particularly in rural areas and agricultural areas, to recharge aquifers, to be used along with recycled wastewater as a way of fortifying ourselves against future droughts, particularly given the fact that, uh, as you can see, Storage capacity in groundwater basins is better than an order of magnitude larger than the amount of water we can store in surface reservoirs. And there are a number of groundwater recharge projects ongoing in California, including the Central Valley and here in the South Coast region. And this is very critical, capturing stormwater, using recycled wastewater, and replenishing groundwater basins. That could be another incentive. There are some international lessons that are uh, useful to note. Uh, these are two cities, Rotterdam and Copenhagen, in which uh, their problem is not so much drought, but more intense flooding as a result of climate variability. Upgrades to storm sewer systems are proving to be extremely expensive. So both cities have adopted and are continuing to adopt less expensive, multi-purpose, low-impact innovations, such as rain gardens, green roofs, et cetera. But this is not a panacea. Other innovations are being introduced, including something called water parks, which are basically areas in which you can store rainwater filtered for long periods of time uh, and, in fact, can be aesthetically pleasing. And then when the water recedes, slowly you have public spaces that can be used for recreational, aesthetic, and, of course, environmental uh, issues as well, environmental protections. By the way, in both Rotterdam and, and Copenhagen, major movers and shakers behind these projects were high school students who came up with ideas for how to reuse uh, stormwater. We were involved in Water UCI in a small project sponsored by the State Water Resources Control Board last year, uh, looking at whether or not stormwater could be harvested in California in a more aggressive way and how it could be part of a resilient water management system. Uh, we work with a number of different universities and also with the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project out in uh, Huntington Beach. And what we d concluded were basically five things. Nothing real surprising here, that you have to evaluate approaches for stormwater capture. Not all approaches are of equal engineering uh, fortitude. You want to identify opportunities and barriers, including regulatory barriers to being able to use stormwater and explore options for funding and private-public part partnership. This cannot be done by governments alone or by water agencies alone. The ultimate users of stormwater have to be somehow incorporated. That means developers, planners, builders. These sorts of actors have to be brought in. And policy questions regarding stormwater risks. There are risks of stormwater being uh, kept in storage for long periods of time. And to identify successful applications here in California and elsewhere that could be applied. So this was a first cut at the issue. We hope to continue to look at it. So where do we stand? Where do we go from here? Well, I'm going to introduce a term again, that term resilience, and a book that I wrote with a number of co-authors that were involved in a National Science Foundation sponsored project uh, on uh, basically what we called low energy water options. And this is a book that came out of that project, uh, The Water Sustainable City. This is a figure that's reproduced in that book. And the long and the short of it is that in looking at a sustainable future, resilience in water, our focus, we say, should not be water agencies. It should be households. Let's start with a house. How can we re-engineer the built environment, the house being one example, to reuse wastewater, to substitute gray water and even black water for things that we would normally use potable water for? That's indicated by the, everything with the letter A, so the dishwasher, the washing machine, bathtubs, uh, water closets, and so forth. Uh, how can we regenerate that water through biofiltration, which will then also regenerate uh, groundwater basins, 
And how can we reduce water use through conservation? What's interesting that this figure also underscores is that we're not saying let's throw out all of our existing water infrastructure. Far from it. We continue to have wastewater treatment systems, uh, waste storage ponds, and drinking water treatment plants. But we supplement all of that with these low energy options. The more we can reuse, substitute, and conserve water, not only do we have to rely less on imported water, but less energy. Why energy? Because treating water is a very energy intensive activity, as are activities such as desalination as a source of water, as I mentioned before. Did we say energy? Yeah, we sure did. In California, water and energy use are especially closely linked. Over 20% of California's electricity, over 20% is used to treat, heat, and move water. Think about that. No water, no energy. No energy, not a lot of water. Uh, we uh, did a study in conjunction with the Department of Energy about uh, three years ago, a number of people that were involved in that project, including Brian Taroa is here. Uh, and what we did is we produced a report that identified needs for developing more spatially and time uh, burdened compatible data between electrical utilities, electrical agencies, and water agencies. Uh, integrating water and electric utility operations were possible regionally to make more efficient use of both resources. More joint energy water projects working together to figure out ways of both efficiently using energy, efficiently using water, and reducing logistical barriers to collaboration, which include regulatory silos. These are industries that are regulated by different uh, government entities and operate under different criteria. We uh, produced a report. I'm not sure if it's still up at the Department of Energy's website, but I can guarantee you uh, we can make it available to you. We have a site that it's available. And we wrote an article for the American Water Works Association talking about ways that we can do the things that I mentioned here. What are some other things that we can do? Well, going back to the theme of the talk, resilience indeed begins at home. And we're working with our local water agencies on things like water saving workshops. If you're going to harvest stormwater, if you're going to tear out your turf, what can you do to use water more efficiently? And in fact, this is some examples of what we do, water saving workshops with uh, local water agencies. Education, extremely important from graduate education, and we have fellows that we sponsor who work on international projects related to water management, as well as domestic projects here in California and throughout the United States. Many of you have been to those events. Uh, we love our outreach program. We think it's one of the best things that we do. And the middle school program, the middle school challenge, which is helping middle school students here in Irvine and also in Newport and Corona Del Mar come up with innovative ways of conserving water. Some say this is a great uh, educational program for adolescents. We say this is a great way to teach the future leaders of water in California. That's what this is about. We want to spread this model throughout the region and beyond. Stakeholder engagement is important whether it be in Los Angeles, where we've written on innovations to uh, manage water, working with our colleagues in Israel, looking at ways of reusing water, and also managing uh, arid uh, regions and the challenges they face in water management. That was one of the things that the uh, uh, BMI, uh, which is the Policy Institute at Tel Aviv University, and us are working on. And even an urban water atlas for Europe. We work with a group called Network H2O, which is affiliated with the European Union, looking at what cities can do to conserve water. Many of you remember all of the news about Cape Town last year. Probably a good place to end this discussion. Uh, Cape Town is a harbinger. Could this happen here? Hope not. Probably not. But there are lessons that are still embedded in Cape Town that certainly are important for much of the world to realize. Averting drought impacts is not cheap or easy. 
alternatives to importing fresh water may be more costly per unit of water. Let's get real. People would say, well, if we did this and we did that, and we did, it would also be cheaper. Not so. It may actually be more expensive, at least in the short run. We need to be honest about the revenues needed to pay for those innovations. And we need to work to build public trust and confidence. Our research in Cape Town notes that, in fact, for the last 25 years, there had been warning signs on the horizon that a water crisis was coming, not only through protracted drought, but through population growth and the failure of local and regional water agencies to invest in infrastructure upgrades. So this was not a sudden crisis. This was an evolving crisis. So we need to work to build public trust and remember that the social and economic costs of doing nothing are greater than the costs of doing something. How not to prepare? Good place to end. As social scientists, we like often thinking in systems frameworks. Uh, some say that perhaps this is exactly what we've done in California, which is go through a kind of hydroelogical cycle of apathy when the drought ends and then uh, becoming concerned and even panicky when the drought continues. This is what we don't want to do. We want to prepare long term, as I indicated. So whatever we do, look before you leap and plan ahead. Thank you. We've got time for questions. Yes, sir. Talk about. Thank you. When you talk about capturing stormwater, is that something you can put? Are those devices you can implement and install in current catch basins, or does it require complete reinstalls? Yeah, so it's interesting. Uh, and in fact, Australia is a good uh, example to use here. Australia, they actually have a legal system that distinguishes rainwater from stormwater. Now, you might be doing as I was about to do when I first heard that distinction. Huh? Rainwater is whatever you can capture on your property. Stormwater is whatever flows off your property and then becomes the responsibility of the local government, the local councils. In either event, what you can do is use this water for purposes that make sense depending on the application. If it's capturing water off your roof and storing it in the tank, uh, you can certainly use it for certain applications, but not potability, not without treatment, because whatever falls off your roof is going to be contaminated with pollutants, and you don't want to drink that water. But you can use it for, as I indicated, other purposes. Now, what about all that storm water? Same problem, only multiplied. Pesticides, rodenticides, fertilizers, oils, chemicals, all over paved surfaces. You can't simply use that water. You have to capture it and somehow treat it. Biofiltration is one means. You can capture it in parks and marshes and actually filter out a lot of the organic contaminants. But a lot of the inorganic contaminants still will have to be treated. There's another wrinkle to this, and it's a wrinkle that particularly applies in areas of the western United States. Uh, in areas where you follow very strictly what we call appropriation law, okay? Whatever water flows through a watershed and ends up on my property is my water. I have a legal right to that. If you capture that water and intercept it, you're actually interfering with my water right. Now, that's not a problem we have in Orange County, but it was a problem they had until a few years ago in Colorado, until the legislature intervened and said, no, 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 you, you go, yeah. Fine. You can capture rainwater and harvest it, and you won't be in violation of somebody's appropriation right downstream. But these are some of the dynamics that really play into this. Does that help? Yeah. Other questions? Yes, sir. Right in the back. Okay. Uh, the bill that had uh, was pending for creating greater reservoirs in Northern California. Do we have any? Yeah, so this is a great question. And this is an issue that's been recurring in California. Some of you might remember before our most recent drought, uh, Governor Schwarzenegger, in fact, advocated very strongly for far upstream reservoirs. Uh, there continues to be discussion, but if going back to that framework I used about, you know, what makes an option resilient, uh, technologically it can work. You can certainly build dams upstream. Uh, economically, 
It hasn't been costed out, which is what we always do with major water projects, so we don't really know if it would be an efficient or equitable means of providing water. But when we go down to those last two components of the matrix, we go down to risks. Well, the risks to ecology are considered to be very high and onerous and probably not mitigable. Building dams far, outstream, uh, far upstream can, in fact, endanger species of fish that are already threatened. So that kind of is putting the kibosh, at least thus far, on aggressive move toward that. And public acceptability. Quite frankly, Californians don't seem to be of a mind to say, let's build some more dams and let's build them further upstream in the foothills of our mountains. So those are obstacles, and that's why things haven't moved on that particular front. Yes? Got to get a microphone to you. Go ahead, Doug. So yeah. we, we sometimes have extra solar and wind power. Yes. And there's work to put into, into batteries. Yes. So if that in turn harvested water from the air or from desalination, yeah. is that cheaper than a battery or, you know? Yeah, great question. And in fact, there's kind of a couple of aspects of that. I mentioned that U.S. Department of Energy report. One of the things we talked about is that one way uh, of kind of integrating electricity and water management is through things like uh, battery storage, microgrids. And in fact, that emphasis on storing electricity also reduces reliance upon water, at least for short periods of time, and is one way of, in fact, uh, improving this balance of the water energy nexus. Reliance on solar power and wind are certainly useful as well. We also did a study, uh, Brian Terrell led, I was involved in, Water UCI was involved in, looking at uh, the water energy nexus, particularly in California. But there are some challenges, and I'm going to come back to the big one. Climate change. Climate variability is going to affect the availability of wind power. It's going to also affect the reliability of the grid. So even relying on renewables, uh, while it can definitely help on the energy front, is helping on the energy front, still is not a panacea. We've got to think about ways of making sure we can protect the power lines that are delivering that power across the grid to other places in California. And that's one of the big challenges, that if you can solve that one, uh, there's probably some metals available somewhere for people who can do that. Yes? More, thank you so much. Regarding some of the additional funding that's coming in with Measure W, with yes. SB1 staying um, on board, and then with Governor Brown recently changing uh, the definition of sewer to now include stormwater as well, there's right. a potential for a huge influx of funding to come in. Are right. there any high pro priority projects that, that you would recommend some of our municipalities uh, kind of go after some low hanging fruit, for yeah. example? Yeah, so quite frankly, I mean, in working with various agencies around the region, what we found, whether it be the water utilities, uh, the retail water providers, uh, as well as the wholesale agencies like the Met, and the Public Works Agency, Orange County Public Works, uh, I would say they're already pretty much on top of the notion of what kind of projects can be developed, and in fact are thinking very uh, long and hard about priorities. The big challenge, and you see this in Prop 1 and a number of the other props that you mentioned, is that in all cases, what the state wants to see, and what we see in all of these measures, is a bottom-up approach, basically saying, we in Sacramento are not going to tell you what projects to develop. You figure it out. You folks are going to have to partner across agencies, across local jurisdictions, because that's the only way things like stormwater harvesting, as we know, can really work. So you need to come up with plans, be willing to put political capital and some economic capital behind it, and develop the partnerships, and we'll support it. That I won't use the word roadblock, but I will say is the thing that I think has provided the greatest inertia against what many were hoping would be a very dramatic change in the culture for these projects. It'll happen, but it is a bottom-up process, and it should be a bottom-up process. I think that's the way it works best. So the agencies are behind it, the public works authorities are behind it, They've begun doing the engineering studies and prioritizing things, but there have to be the political will 
to be able to acquire the land, to be able to move projects forward, and to partner across jurisdictions. Circling back to the water energy nexus you're uh, referencing, what's your opinion on pumped storage projects? And are there any are there any further projects in consideration that I guess some of us haven't heard about? Yeah, so pump storage. Uh, it, pump storage is an interesting concept because, of course, when you try to explain it to any layperson, they go, "Wait a minute, you're using electricity to move water uphill." And isn't that expensive? And isn't that energy inefficient? And blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. Well, as we know, no, it isn't. In fact, it can make sense if the power you're using is uh, off-peak power, and then you're using the pump storage project to generate electricity uh, during peak periods, peak demand periods. It can work. And in fact, there are innovations that have been done, uh, particularly in Arizona and here in parts of California on pump storage. There are some challenges, however. And the challenges sort of harken back to some of the things we talked about in terms of particularly environmental risks and public acceptability. Can you sell the public on these projects? Can you find appropriate places to do it where the environmental impacts can be mitigated? And of course, who will uh, pay for these projects? It doesn't make sense everywhere in all places, but it can make sense as a very significant uh, way of using energy that would have just gone off the grid and, and not being put to use in terms of a future supply of water. So it can be done, and it should be done. You have to look at it very carefully within this larger mix. We have time for one more question, okay. and Stephen has been raising his hand right. okay. since you asked for a question. John? Okay. First of all, let me... Okay. Thank Two you so questions. much for technology. Yeah, I told God you. bless that technology. The, that was not the panacea. Go ahead. Be that as it may. Yeah, go ahead. You indicated how individual households could contribute to this as a solution. Right. Are there comparable measures that can be taken in commercial buildings? Uh, and in many cases, increasingly, people in California are not living in individual households, but they're living in yak yak right. and so forth. Right what type of efforts there. And yeah. then the other question, if you choose to address it, is what's happening in other states? I think of Arizona in particular, which has both the energy and the uh, water challenges, as well as enormous growth in population. But yeah. again, thank you, great sure. talk. Oh, you're welcome. So very briefly on the first question, uh, yeah, of course, commercial buildings. There is uh, uh, the notion of green buildings. The U.S. Green Building Council has developed a number of innovative standards for energy saving, water saving. Absolutely can be done in commercial structures, is being done in commercial structures. The other part of that first question, though, in terms of, you know, moving people out of single family domiciles, you know, that's a, that's a huge urban planning debate in California and in other places. The one thing I will say about that that resonates with my remarks is, Whatever we do on that front, we need to incentivize it, not mandate it. If we mandate it, we're going to create more social friction and less solutions of this problem. If there are options for people to do this and do it in ways that end up saving water and energy, all for it, and that can work. Second part, Arizona. Uh, I served on the advisory board for a, a group based in Phoenix at Arizona State University called the Decision Center for a Desert City, very appropriately named uh, center. Uh, Phoenix is definitely keen on reuse. They're also keen on groundwater management. Uh, in my opinion, as, an, as a Californian, and my opinion doesn't count for much whenever I cross the line into Arizona, uh, as you might imagine, but uh, my opinion is I don't think they're doing nearly enough. Now, one of the things, water rate structures, huge reluctance uh, to impose rate structures that will lead to uh, higher water conservation. Uh, energy use, uh, what can I say? Uh, it's a hugely energy-intensive culture. Uh, when I compare Phoenix with Las Vegas, I give a lot of points to Las Vegas on what they're doing with water management. I don't give as many points to uh, Phoenix. 
they're learning, they're starting, but there's tremendous political resistance to change, at least in southern Arizona. And in part, the Central Arizona Project has facilitated that because Arizona gets a huge share of the Colorado River. And again, when I, coming from California, I can't express too many opinions on that without, you know, being, you know, hauled out of the state physically. But, you know, the fact that we did things wrong in our past shouldn't excuse others to continue to do the wrong things in the present. So I want to thank you all for coming. I want to tell you that Dave is a fantastic example, his work of how we need to look at people and environments and the systems that interconnect them, which is what social ecology is about. I'm a psychologist, I study individuals, and many times in Dave's presentation, he sounded like a psychologist. Basic Psych 101, people do more for reward than punishment. So it's a really great example of that, and for really kind of showing us how the water crisis is so multifaceted. I want to call your attention to another wonderful presentation Wednesday at 5 on the Flint water crisis, and we have a presentation put on by um, Gorin and the CEO Roundtable that really highlights the, the issue by the woman who was really the one to kind of out the water crisis. So thank you all. Let's give Dave a big round of applause. We learned a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a gardener. So I got rid of my lawn and a friend of all of you know covered with plants. Well then we had that one dollar plant. So if you don't think about